This is a story from 1917. It's a historical fiction that follows two very different women through the aftermath of an enormous man-made explosion. It's a historic event that I'd never heard of before. And author Donna Alward really puts us there. In the time period and in this cascading series of tragedies. I first met Donna through her online book club and YouTube community with her good friend, Barbara Tanner Wallace. It's called Step Into the Story. It's authors talking to other authors about their work. It's great. Donna has been a prolific and successful romance writer. This is her first historical fiction. I'm excited that we're talking about her new novel, When the World Fell Silent. I spent almost 20 years in the romance genre. And I was getting to a point where I felt like I wanted to do something a little different, new challenge, whatever. You know, I was also getting close to 50. So I thought, you know, like, might be time to, you know, do something different. And it was just when the pandemic was starting Mm -hmm. and lockdowns were happening. And I was actually approached to write a historical set in Canada, which Mm -hmm. was interesting. And I am one of those believers in, you know, serendipity and, and, you know, signs from the universe and (laughs) whatnot. So I thought this is a real opportunity. Mm -hmm do I want to take it? And, you know, I hesitated for maybe, you know, five minutes because scary. Um, Historical fiction is difficult in that it's more complex. There's a lot of research. There's trying to blend what happened in history with your story. And and so I knew if, if I wanted a challenge, here it was. And then I just thought, if not now, when? I've always loved reading historical fiction. It's probably my favorite genre to read in my downtime. So I just thought, you know, I'm going to do it. If it doesn't go well, then I'll do something else. But, you know, I'm always going to regret not trying, especially when, like, the universe was really giving me the big nudge. Yeah. So I did. And then this is sort of what happened. And I fell in love with writing it and... And yeah, I'm just, I'm really happy that I did it. Yeah. And I can feel your grounding or your training, your experience in romance come through this story. This is in a lot of ways, a love story, but not just in the traditional sense of a love story. There's also, it's really this, this look at love in many different relationships, I think, Yeah, uh, which just. So tell me a little bit about your two main characters. We are, we're really, you're telling this story through a woman named Nora and a woman named Charlotte. Um, Talk a little bit about, about why you, why you chose these two women to to tell this fiction through. Yeah, because they're different women, you know, they, they come from different, um, their lifestyles are very different. You know, Nora's more, I would say, middle class. She really doesn't want to go the marriage and children route, at least not quite yet. She has ambitions, which in 1917 is, you know, a little, a little different. And so she goes on to be a nurse and then she joins the Canadian Army Medical Corps and as a nurse and is nursing at Camp Hill Hospital in Halifax. And so she's, you know, she lives a different kind of life from Charlotte and Charlotte is a war widow with a baby she lives in a very working class neighborhood. She now lives with her in-laws and they don't treat her really great. Yeah. Uh, they certainly don't make her feel like a warm part of the family, but she doesn't have a lot of options either. I mean, women don't have a lot of options in 1917 period, but she has fewer advantages than, than Nora, than Nora does. So I wanted to examine it from both, from both sides and how, both of these women would react to or be affected by such a great tragedy as the Halifax explosion. And so that's kind of where those came from in, you know, in ways that they were different. You know, Charlotte is very family focused and loves being a mom. It's, it's her whole reason for going on. And that's not what Nora wants at all. And then through the, throughout the story, we kind of see that flip. And so that was really fun to, to sort of 
maneuver. Yeah. Yeah. You have really, you've given the reader a really good sense, I think, of what a woman's role or expectations are in this time frame. Like you keep touching into that. Almost in every situation, there's some reminder that, uh, oh, if I weren't a woman, I could maybe take this path, but because I'm a woman, I have limited options. So you Uh do that a lot, I think, through both of those characters. Um, And I really appreciated uh, in the narration, in the audio book, hearing um, their characters, like as you just described them, they are really different and yet they sort of have this, they have an arc of growth, both of them. Um, And I felt that in the audio. I think too, there's, even though they are very different in some ways, they're both Haligonians. Like they're, they're both women in this city at this time. And so there's a shared experience, no matter what your class is, there's a shared experience in going through something as devastating as this event together. And it did bring people together regardless of of yeah. class. So there's a commonality, even though things are are very different. So I thought it was really neat to see how both both narrators were different and yet still had that same collective experience of being in Halifax at that time. You just brought up the the, the Halifax explosion, which is at the heart of this story. This is our historical yes. fact that anchors it to us that I'm I never had never heard of. But you you start with we're in this backdrop of the war, both of these women are, their lives have been dramatically impacted by the war. One is nursing in a hospital, um, you know, with soldiers recovering. One, as you mentioned, is a war widow and her whole life is now with her in-laws. And uh, so you have the backdrop of that and, and then enters this catastrophic event. Um, Talk, talk a little bit about what the Halifax explosion is. What happened? Okay. <laughs> Fun fact is that I didn't learn about this in history class either. And I grew up one province over. I don't know why. I learned about it in literature class. I took an Atlantic literature class in grade 12. And I read a book called Barometer Rising by Hugh McLennan. It's a Canadian classic. And that's how I learned that the explosion really happened, which that still blows my mind that this was not part of our curriculum in social studies or history. What happened was no, um, Halifax was a very important port in World War I. Part of it is because it's a deep water port. It also doesn't freeze in the winter. Then it it's kind of shaped. I think in the book, I describe it like the curve of a, of a woman's waist. Yes. Yeah. So, and it's appropriately called the Narrows and then empties into the Bedford Basin. So ships would come in and they would actually go into the security of the Bedford Basin and wait and form convoys and then go overseas. Mm -hmm. So on December 5th, a munitions ship from New York called the Mont Blanc anchored outside of the harbor and it anchored outside because it arrived just a little too late to go inside, the subnets were already across the harbor. So it had to wait. Then the next morning, it was allowed into the harbor. At the same time, a relief ship called the EMO, IMO, was leaving. And they had a difference of opinion about right of way. And I mean, there are lots of court cases about this, but who was to blame, but the end result was they collided. And the Mont Blanc caught on fire. Most people didn't know. I mean, there were a handful of people who knew what was on board because it's wartime. You don't want it, you know, broadcast that you're carrying munitions. Right, right. So when it caught on fire, most people were like, oh, it's caught on fire. This is so exciting. You know, people are going to go fight the fire. They have no idea of what it, what's about to happen. And then shortly after nine o'clock, the ship explodes. It decimates a whole section of the city, um, like takes the buildings to like toothpicks. Like there's, it's just flattened. Yeah. Almost 2,000 people killed, about 9,000 wounded, around I think 25,000 left without adequate housing. In the space of a moment, this happened. And Halifax is not a huge city. I think um, you describe it 
um, either in your forward or your afterward, I can't remember which, is as the largest man-made explosion in history before the use of the atom bomb. Like, I think you kind of peeled that back for the reader a little bit at a time. Like, we we discover the devastation almost as our characters are discovering that, oh, this whole neighborhood is, is gone. It's, it's gone. gone. Yeah. It's gone. They felt like windows rattled like in a community that is now 45 minutes away mm-hmm. by, by highway. I think as you describe this, this catastrophe, this devastation, you, you were very visual in the way you wrote about it. Like I really started to feel it and you got even specific about kinds of injuries. So there's a, a special doctor who, uh, who comes in to town to handle one of these particular like mass injuries that happens. Can you talk a little bit about that? I don't think it's a spoiler, you know, it's, I know uh, it's not oh, because it's, it's not an unusual thing. Like this is the thing about yeah. fiction, right? Like you've woven this into the story, but it really was the case it really was yeah he really existed and his name was dr cox he was an oculist Mm -hmm. and when when the explosion happened and of course word got out immediately doctors and assistants from all over um, started trying trying to get to halifax and so he was an oculist from i believe new glasgow which is a couple of hours away from here And he went to Camp Hill and he worked on treating eye injuries. And the interesting thing about so many eye injuries was that it wasn't just people who were, for example, on the docks that survived and, you know, got hit by shrapnel or or whatnot. A lot of people, because like many harbors, Halifax is built on a hill above up the harbor and people would go to their windows to watch what was going on so they're standing at their windows looking at this spectacle and when the explosion happens what happens to all the glass and so there there were so many eye injuries uh he had he worked for days and doing removals either you know people were either blinded or partially blinded um he would do repairs um But he did have, and it is rather a graphic thing, but I put it in because I thought this is something that really happened. And it's a very small detail, but something that really gets the point across and how bad this was. There's a point where Nora is is going on a very small break and she passes Dr. Cox and there's a bucket of eyeballs. And it's the first time, and she's a nurse, it's the first time in the whole day and all the injuries that she's seen that she's felt sick. How crazy that is that there are so many eye injuries. And actually that was the biggest mass blinding that and the soldiers coming home with, with eye injuries that it led to the formation of the Canadian national Institute of the blind, which I think is really interesting and something that's personal to me too, because my mom is legally blind. So I thought that was a really, a really interesting fact to bring in. Yeah. Yes. And it's very, uh, it's very relatable. This idea that like you could, you could feel that you could feel that there was something happening in the Harbor and people are at their windows and um, yes, it was, it was, uh, it was a really, it was a moment in the book where I was like, Oh, it was very, very real. And I think that's one of the things that, that I like about historical fiction is it takes some moment or event the statistic about the size of the explosion, the amount of ground that's damaged, the number of buildings that are flattened, the number of lives that are lost. But then these details about the specific kind of injuries that happened and the way that the hospital had to deal with it. And, and then the long-term effects of that, the fact that it had a ripple effect into the, into the society, you know, you, you, you weave that back into the story as we get later in the book. Um, The number of people then that had to be, had to learn how to live with blindness works its way into the community. And yeah. Community. yeah. So, but that's yeah. the great thing about historical fiction, don't you think? Is that it takes all the stats and the, you know, the dates and the facts and the figures and it breathes life into them because it, it focuses on the humanity right. and the people. And that's why I love historical fiction. 
yeah. is because it's about the people and it's the story. It's not just what happened. It's the story of it. Right. One of the other things that I wanted to talk about these two women, and you t- you touched on a very bit at the very beginning, uh, is how motherhood or um, the desire to be a mother and how we are changed by motherhood is lives with both of these different women. Was that, did that evolve as you were writing or did you go in with that? Like, this is how that's probably going to intersect. That's a great question. I kind of went into that, like knowing, yeah. but mostly not, you know, I, I let those things evolve as I was writing, particularly with Nora um, and how things, her, her attitude and the things that she needed to change about her life and her feelings about it without going into spoilers, um, how that really took a lot of adjustment. And I didn't always know that that was going to happen until we got to that moment. And I'm like, well, how does she feel about this? Like, this is who she was and this is what she wanted. And now, you know, circumstance means that she has to make a choice here. And how does she feel about that choice? Yeah. You know, and, and so I think, I think I did a lot of that on the fly, but that's what characters do for me is that they also sort of unwrap themselves as we go along and I discover more about them as I go. And, and we just dig deeper and deeper. And sometimes they make choices that surprise me. And that's okay. I embrace that because I think that's, I don't like to be too strong handed with my characters. Like I like to give them room to breathe and then they sort of reveal themselves to me. And I just, I'm just the fingers. <laughs> that's, really, that's amazing. Yeah. That's one of the audio clips that I have. There's an emotion um, in, the portrayal too in the read of that Charlotte's injured by this explosion and she's in the hospital and she's, her daughter is missing. And as she's waking up, she realizes her daughter's missing. And there is a lot of, you know, how powerful motherhood is for her right then. You fe- you really feel that in that scene. Okay, so let's pause right there in our conversation and listen to some of the audiobook. This is narrator Ivana Rakic. She's a Serbia-born actress who also holds citizenship for Hungary and the UK. Ivana works in London as an actress, mostly in film and television. Here, she's reading the role of Charlotte. This is from When the World Fell Silent. Produced by Robbie Robertson and cast by Rupert Morgan. I need to find her. Perhaps the papers. The nurse tucked away the old bandage. I can bring you a paper, Mrs. Campbell, but it... Well, it might be a bit overwhelming. More overwhelming than not knowing where my daughter was? I doubted it. All right, let's have a look at these stitches, Dr. McLeod said, shifting the sheet to examine my wound. His fingers were gentle, but even so the touch hurt, and I winced as he seemed to probe in all the tender spots. It's healing well. There was significant trauma to your leg, Mrs. Campbell, but you didn't lose it, so there's a blessing. Blessings. Well, wasn't that right up there with being lucky? I wasn't feeling particularly blessed at the moment. How much more loss was I supposed to take? First, my parents. Then, after such a brief happiness, I lost Frank. The only reason I'd kept going at all after his death was because I had Aileen to love, and who loved me back. What reason did I have now if Aileen was gone? Grief ballooned inside me a huge ball of it sitting on my chest, making it hard to breathe. I started to picture what might have happened to her, what might have happened to her little body. And suddenly I was gasping for air. Oh God, was this how she'd felt? Suffocating? 
afraid? So when we were choosing narrators, because I was in on this process and they sent me some samples of the two narrators and I liked them both immediately. So we didn't even have to go through this huge casting process. But I was a little concerned about the accent because I'm Nova Scotian. It's very distinctive, but it's not a Newfoundland accent, but there's similarities. And and so I thought, okay, if this is going to be Halifax, then it needs to sound like Halifax. So I mentioned this and they were doing a little research into the vowel sounds and that kind of thing. And then my editor emailed me and she goes, would you mind reading a section, like taping yourself, reading a section from each character? And I was like, no, that would be great. But this was, I would say like early May. And my daughter was here with a newborn baby in the house. And so (laughs) I ended up going out into my truck with my phone and a piece of like sheet of paper and reading like partial scenes from each character and saving it and sending it along. And then she gave those to the narrators and they were able to listen to my voice and how I would read those characters and pick up my, my accent. Wow. Yeah, it was really, it was really fun part of the experience, but I kind of laughed about the fact that I sat out in my truck. It was a nice closed space, you know, and probably pretty good audio actually. (laughs) I, I, I really don't know, but, but it was the best I could do at the time. Nobody here was sleeping. Like he was born the end of April. So oh my um, he was very, very wee and up every, you know, two hours. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was how that worked. And then I was really happy with how it all, it all turned out. Okay. Let's listen to the other narrator on this project. Reading the role of Nora, the nurse is Laurence Bouvard. Originally from Boston, Massachusetts, she is an American-French dual national. She is a linguistics graduate from Harvard University. This is from When the World Fell Silent, with narrator Laurence Bouvard. Jane sat on the Chesterfield and patted the seat beside her. I've been meaning to talk to you, Nor, about Allie. I sat down, wondering if Jane could possibly tell what had transpired only an hour ago. Did I look different? I certainly felt different. Could she smell the liquor? He's shipping out, I said. He got his orders. I twisted my fingers together in my lap, wanting nothing more than to climb the stairs and go to bed. Oh, Jane slumped a little next to me. I'm sorry. I know you must be worried. I nodded, abashed when a tear gathered in the corner of my eye and slipped down my cheek. I cared for him deeply. And yet, when he'd said he loved me, I hadn't said it back. Why was that? Because right now, the thought of never seeing him again. How do you do it, Jane? How do you go every day not knowing if Jimmy is all right? Jane's gaze met mine. It's like that then. You're not just flirting. You're in love. I shrugged a little and frowned as guilt piled upon guilt. When you did what we'd done, you were supposed to love each other. Bad enough to do it without being married. But this was worse, wasn't it? I'm not sure, Jane but I do care about him very much. Oh, Nora. I bristled at the sympathy and despair in my sister's voice. What's wrong with that? I asked rather sharply. There's all kinds of little family bits and and the different roles and where you belong in each unit. And I, I had so much fun. (laughs) <laughs> just play just playing with families and and you know what those relationships were and and people's function and place within them and and what they meant and yes and how complicated they can be and how complicated they can be that's for sure yeah because i think that um one of those relationships of course is sisterhood i think there's a lot 
there's a lot going on with Nora there in what she chooses to share. And then also just how you let us know how well her sister really knows her. Better than she knows herself sometimes. Because yeah. I know there's a place where, you know, after the explosion where Nora has to really step up and be efficient and, you know, be a great nurse. And, and it's about her professionalism. And she realizes that her sister was right about the kind of person she is and how something that happens earlier, again, trying not to spoil, but something that happens earlier is act, is actually out of character for her. Yeah. And how, you know, her sister knew that all along. And because honestly, once she is functioning within the hospital, she realizes that this is the real her. Like she loves her job. She loves being a nurse and she's good at it. So, you know, it, I just, I don't know. I, I think my big thing is I will always write very character driven stories. And I think this is certainly a character driven story with a historical event as a backdrop. Yes. And really strong women. They're very, yes. very strong and they do rise to the occasion and they do um, not just on their own behalf, but on the behalf of others. There's a great sense of service in this story too, I think. I love that. I'm glad that came across. That makes me really happy. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it when we started about how you gravitate towards serendipities um, and the idea that the universe is sort of unfolding as it should for you. Uh, and there's a couple places where characters voice that, I think, in the story. There's a moment where you have a child speaking and she's talking about a dream that she's had, um, that something something prescient has come to her in a dream. Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think you... There's times where the uh, even the main characters are talking and one says to the other something like, you know, I don't know. I don't know what you if you're a religious woman or what you believe in, but I think this happened for a reason. Um, and I I really I like that idea of things happening for a reason, things unfolding as they should. And I, I could feel that that was something important to you as an author as I read it. It is. And it's funny because as a as a person. I go through this sort of push pull between everything happens for a reason and you make your own luck. You know what I mean? I know. And so like, there's this whole self-determination side of me, which is, you know, no one's going to do this for you. You have to do this for yourself and you make your own luck. But I also believe that things happen for a reason. Now, did something I do, you know, sort of make that possible? Like I, like, I don't think I'm out there floating with and just letting things happen to me. But at the same time, I do have this feeling like things happen for a reason. And how we deal with that shows who we are. I hope that makes sense or not. Oh, it makes great sense. Because I think you actually, you express that through characters. You, you I, I think it's interesting because I think we always see that in reverse. It's usually looking over our shoulder at something that has already happened that you can go, oh, that's why that happened. Uh, yes. And I think there's some comfort in that when things, um, I don't know, that things don't always go the way you want, right? And you also don't want to say uh, you're responsible for the way things unfold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, we don't have that kind of power. But it is, I think there's some comfort in in being able to look over your shoulder and go, oh, I'm glad that that happened. Or I see the benefits of why that happened or how that happened. And um and also that people kind of intersect with us, that we get people in our path, that sometimes we go like, oh. I'm That's sorry. why. Oh, I know the scene that you're thinking of, where it's like, if this hadn't happened, then we wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. And because we're here right now, my life is going to be better. You know, and and so, and that's, I think if it's, we're thinking of the same scene, it's toward the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. And. The thing is, it's not, again, there's this push-pull with um, self-determination and, and you guiding your own life. This is getting rather philosophical. But also realizing that there are there's power in surrender and realizing that there are things in this life that we cannot control. The only thing we can control is how we move forward after them. 
Right. And so, and so, you know, letting go of some of that and then, you know, taking back our power and what we can control. That's a really interesting dynamic to explore. Yeah. Yes. And I think you've given that uh, these very strong, independent um, women who, who don't just serve themselves, but serve those around them too. Like there is that we're all, that we are part of community. Uh, that yeah. This is a book a lot about relationship. It's a lot about community. It is how we handle adversity and tragedy and calamitous things that we have no control over. Like, yeah, there's all of that weaves into it. It is philosophical. I think your storytelling has, um, I don't think you have to scratch very far below the surface to, to kind of understand Donna's philosophy of life. Like, I think there's a lot in these characters that, um, that feels essential. Um, there's a lot of good messages to it. Oh, well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. This is, uh, this is my kind of book. Um, is there anything that I, that I didn't ask you about that you think is really important to talk about for the, when the world fell silent? I don't think so. Like we dug into some stuff that I haven't talked about on any, like <laughs> with anybody before. So like, we kind of dug a little deep into it, which I love. I love that the conversation went there. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. The The name of this podcast is Desideratum is actually based on a poem. It is all about essential things. And so it is really important to me, I think, sometimes to, to get below the surface of stuff and talk about what's essential. Actually, there is something you could ask me about. Okay. There's a whole lot of, like, there's some mental health issues that crop up, like how you deal with trauma and stuff. Yeah. So um, dealing with trauma in 1917 is very different than how we would deal with it today. Charlotte in particular, we see has a bit of a mental health break. And so one of the things that was challenging for me was how to describe what was happening without using terms that we would use now, like trying to keep it relevant to 1917, but also get it clear to the reader exactly what was happening. Yeah. And how trauma is processed without actually using terms like trauma and PTSD. And, you know, like, yeah, so I, I, you know what, that it's so interesting <laughs> that you bring it up that way, because I, I hadn't really thought about how it's, it is in the language. Let's face it. She had a head injury. Yes. Because I couldn't really say, well, you know, Charlotte has a TBI. It's how do I show the reader that so that they kind of know what's going on? You know, so it was a little delicate to try to to try to work around and um, and make clear. And also, like, I'm just I'm such a huge believer in, um, you know, dealing with trauma and, you know, not shoving it down and and finding ways to, to be whole again, like for people to be whole again and healing. So, so that was, that formed a big part for me as well. Yes. And Charlotte's character um, goes through this trauma and is released from the hospital. And so, yes, not just the language um, for how we talk about it today, but the assistance and the care that she would receive today uh, wasn't in the wheelhouse of care in that you're on your own yes and so uh just largely she's left on her own to recover but how she processes her what we would call trauma today yeah you have to do you did you did that really delicately <laughs> did a lot of rewriting and a lot of second guessing myself right like just looking at it and going is this is this right is this plausible is this doing what I hope it will achieve? Have I said too much? Have I not said enough? Like it really was sort of walking a fine line. Yeah. But I think in the end, after my editor went at it as well, but I think I think we got to a place where, you know, it was handled the way I wanted to handle it. Yeah. Yes, you put the reader in her head, you get to feel what she's feeling a little bit. And that helps you understand some of the decisions that she makes. I'm really glad you brought that up because now I'm really thinking about how artistically you did that. Again, that kind of reminds me that you are a romance writer at heart, right? Because you do then bring us to 
a happy place. Or at least a hopeful place. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't want to, I mean, I had a choice to make at the end of the, toward the end of the book where I could have let something stand and that would have been the end. I actually didn't know how that was going to end until about 10,000 words before I got there. Cause I kept going back and forth on what I wanted to do and what would be the best ending for, for the character and also for the reader, you know, what's the reader going to walk away with and trying to reconcile those two things. And, um, and then I, and then the ending sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. And uh, I was like, oh, that makes sense. And I was very happy with that. And then when I told my editor, she was also happy with that. Yeah. Um, because I really am, as much as I try not to be, I'm a very hopeful person and very optimistic. And there's a line in, in South Pacific in um, one of the songs that, you know, I'm, here like a dope with this thing called hope and I can't get it out of my heart um so and that's that's me as much as I try to be a curmudgeon and you know fatalistic and whatever Realistic. Uh, yeah. I yeah I I am a hopeful person so um I wanted to end it on a note of you know maybe things aren't perfect um but at least there's hope and so that's that's yeah. kind of my final word on the book yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's a great final word. Yeah. Thanks so much for, um, for talking to me about it. I always love talking to you. Oh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this time with Donna Allward as much as I did. If you enjoyed listening to narrators Lawrence Bouvard and Ivana Rakik, and you want to listen to the rest of When the World Fell Silent, I would love it if you follow my affiliate link to the audiobook platform, Libro.fm. I partner with Libro.fm because they support local bookstores. You can designate a local-to-you bookstore to support with every audiobook purchase you make on Libro.fm. I'll put an affiliate link that supports this podcast in my show notes. It's also on my website, or you can reach out to me through my socials, and I'll send the link right to you. As always, thanks for listening.